I am working on the second half of this chapter, chapter, uh, what chapter is it, chapter five? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, chapter five. I have so many other classes, like you, see, you can see so many other PowerPoints, so it's usually I just go from one class to another. Yeah, chapter five. So for your second exam, it's gonna be chapter four, five, and 11. So chapter five, we're going through the atomic mass right now and talking about what the atomic mass unit is. So as we're talking about the atomic mass unit, we're talking about the mole. And so the idea here is, before we get into all the details, I'm already defining what exactly the mole is. So in order for scientists to figure out what the mole was, first of all, let's define some terms. There are words, there are certain words that stand for numerical value, specific numerical value. So the idea is when we say these words based on knowledge and culture, let me make sure this is actually, it looks like it is recorded, let me make sure it is recorded. And I'll continue. Yep. When we say pair, it's understood that a pair stands for two. When we say a week, a week usually stands for seven days, so just seven. Uh, when we say, let's see, a decade, decade usually stands for 10, right? Like 10 years, seven days, two objects. And of course, when you say a century, Century usually stands for 100, right? So it can be 100 years. But you understand that these words are usually tied to a specific numerical value. So when it came to um, working with atoms in the lab, scientists noticed that when you're in the lab, we tend to measure chemicals at a certain amount. The amounts that we, we measure in the lab are usually molar amounts. And what does molar amount mean? The amount is so large that it's difficult to figure out how many atoms or molecules are in the amount. It's difficult. We don't really have instruments in the lab that you can just take, you know, like a teaspoon of sugar or a teaspoon of salt and then pour it in the machine and then press start. And then somehow it tells us how many atoms or molecules are in there. So scientists figure it out, especially chemists, Let's find an easier way to relate the molar amount to the number of atoms and molecules because this relationship is very important. So in trying to figure out the relationship, they decided to study the element that was easily accessible and safe to work with. So they discovered of the first few elements, carbon, okay, which carbon has three isotopes. There's a carbon-12, a carbon-14, and a carbon-13. They notice that in the world around us, this is the most abundant, meaning it's the most available. So they're like, you know what? It is very available, most abundant, and it's safe to work with. They decided we will use carbon as our standard. What is our goal? Our goal is to find the relationship with between the amounts we work on in the lab, which is at the mole level, and the number of atoms actually in that moles or the number of molecules. When we have a spoon of sugar, you know, it reminds me of that song, a spoonful of sugar, right? When we have a spoonful of sugar, exactly how many atoms or molecules of sugar are in that spoonful? Well, up until they discovered that they didn't know. So, after doing a bunch of experiments using different technology, they discovered that if you weigh, if you take 12 grams, okay, so that, imagine this is 12 grams, right? 12.000 grams of carbon-12 isotope. So use this or this, just this one here. And you were to place this amount, after you measured it to be 12.000, place this amount inside a machine and, and you know, do a bunch of experiments to figure out how many atoms were in here, they found out that 
this amount of carbon 12 isotope had exactly 6.022 i don't hope, know the whole number but times 10 power 23 atoms of carbon you're like oh okay so 12 grams of carbon has this amount here then what if we have one gram of carbon right what if we have one gram of carbon essentially if you have one gram of carbon it will equal the atomic mass unit so after understanding how many particles were in 12 grams of carbon and then trying to compare if 12 grams of carbon have this amount here then we can say that each gram of carbon equal one atomic mass unit. So you don't necessarily have to memorize the formula of atomic mass unit. What do you need to know from here on? All you need to know from here on is the numbers we have in the periodic table has two units. So I'm telling you what you need to know from here on. In the periodic table, so say for example, I look at hydrogen, I'm looking at hydrogen right now. I have it in my periodic table right here. Hydrogen, has an atomic mass. So hydrogen, the element, has an atomic mass. So when I read this out, it's 1.008. You can report it as 1.008 AMU. This is the same thing as saying the atomic mass of hydrogen is technically close to 1 12th the mass of carbon, right? But we're not going to try to complicate. We're going to keep things simple. So the atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.008 AMU, or down the road, this same number will have a different unit, 1.008 grams per mole, okay? So for the most part, when you guys are learning chemistry, you, you guys learn chemistry a lot differently than I learn chemistry. I think it has to do with my personality. Well, I forgot to do the 23 here. It has to do with my personality. I'm the kind of kid, when I was a kid, I was the kind of kid that asked a lot of questions. I was asked, why are you always asking all the questions? I'm like, because I want to know more. I don't understand. And I was the kind of kid that asked a lot of questions. So when I was in class, I was the kid that was raising my hand. I didn't mind looking stupid because I had a goal. I want to understand what is being communicated with, to me. And then I really paid attention. And then half the time, I didn't understand what was being communicated. So when I got to this part as a middle schooler, I'm like, wait. Why does it have two different units? And how do we know which unit to use when? So I learned later on, later on, depending on what you're working on, you're either going to use the same number, the top unit or the bottom unit. So I'll tell you this, just to kind of ease, if you, if you have the kind of mind I used to have, I'll say about 10% of the time we use the top unit. The rest of the time, 90%, we're using the bottom unit right here, okay? Because my question was, if the same number has two different units, how do I know which one I use when? I don't want to put this number here and get it wrong when the answer was this unit here, okay? So for this part, we use this unit. Later on, we'll use the same number, different unit. Okay, moving on. So scientists discovered, once again, that as I mentioned back here, you have three different isotopes of carbon, right? Carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. So how were scientists able to discover there were many isotopes of carbon? Well, they discovered this because technology was increasing. So just to kind of fill in the gap, remember, we had just talked about Dalton's atomic model, and we talked about his success, and we praised him and said, Dalton, Dalton, you did a good job. And the, and the way you presented your, your model was great. Because of Dalton, we were able to understand how chemicals behave in a reaction, right? Chemicals in a reaction. He was able to help scientists talk about the conservation of mass. Thank you, Dalton, for that, conservation of mass. Because of Dalton, scientists were able to understand that chemical formulas have very specific ingredients. It's gotta be the same chemical in the same um, amount all the time. So that's called the law of definite proportion. 
okay, saying that if you have a certain chemical, it has the same elements all the time in the same amount. So I'm paraphrasing these laws, right? The other thing we said was, oh yeah, thanks to Dalton, now we understand if the same two chemicals combine to form two different compounds, those compounds are actually related by a whole number. That is called the law of multiple proportion. So I explained all of this last week. So after we praise Dalton for all the great things he did, now we are criticizing him, okay? So in criticizing Dalton, not, in, not to hurt his feelings, to say, you know what? Due to advancement in technology and due to more understanding that we have for the we understand something called isotopes exist, okay? So after I explain to you what these AMUs are, scientists working with engineers and people and technology use this equipment. It's called a mass spectrum. Well, the equipment is actually called a mass spectrometer. Mass spectrometer. And we actually have one of these on campus. And the mass spectrometer does what the name says here. So mass is the unit of measurement that they use to, to judge the chemicals. And then spectra just means like a spectra, like a graph. And then meter means to measure, okay? So these terms here have root, have root meanings. Meter means to measure. So we are measuring the mass. And then spectra also means separation, okay? Separation, or you can look at it as sorting. So the mass spectrometer, mass spectrometer, separates, if I can spell right, separates elements or even molecules, just chemicals in general, elements or molecules based on their masses. Ooh, I can't spell. <laughs> and as I say, I can't spell, it's getting even worse. <laughs> based on their masses. So it separates them based on their masses, and then it counts them. So it doesn't just separate, it separates and counts. There was this one job I had this one time in my life, years ago. Like, I mean, years ago. Where we, were, we, we, we got a sample's powder, and it was like a white powder, and I was like, uh, okay. But everybody knew what the, the, it, was. it was. It was a vitamin. It wasn't anything, you know, I wasn't supposed to have. And one of the jobs I had to do was to figure out the particle size. So they gave me a bunch of C's, right? And, um, right. And I was supposed to take my sample, my powder, and pass it through the C's. So they gave me a bunch of, like, big C's, small C's, really, really small C's. And in the end, I was supposed to figure out how much of these samples were stuck, were held behind in any C, in each of the C's. So in a way... The experiment I was doing there was based on the size of the particle, but this kind of works the same way too, because when the size is large, the large particles have a greater mar mass. The large particles also have a greater mass, right? So here we're seeing, let's see, this is our graph. The graph has a y-axis called relative abundance. Abundance is a word that means a lot, right? But it's like, so it's not like relative a lot, but it's like a comparison between the availability. Which one is the most available? If you were to go out there and investigate and find the chemical, which version of the same chemical will you find the most of? Here they're showing you the isotopes. 20, 21 and 22. So the idea here is, according to Dalton, because remember, the purpose of scientists finding this out was because Dalton had told everyone in his work that the same element or an element tends to have atoms, and all the atoms belonging to the same elements are alike. So let me let me rewrite that. Atoms of the same element are alike in a 
every way. So scientists were expecting, once they found the atoms in the same element, that all they will find for this one will be one line, and all the atoms will have the exact same mass, which is a mass of 20. But the experiment showed them like, uh-uh, that's not true. These come from the same element, but some of the masses have, some of the elements, when you, when you weigh the atoms, some of the atoms had a mass of 20, other ones had a mass of 21, and the other ones had a mass of 22. But then they belong to the same element. But you look back at what Dawson said, and he said, atoms from the same element are alike in every way. In other words, if you were to weigh them, they would weigh the same. Well, how do you explain three different weights from the same atom? Okay? And what this looks like, this looks like, um, let's see, the mass 20. So this looks like neon. So instead of having just one type of neon, now we're looking at three different types of neon. You have the heavier, uh, the, sorry, the heavier neon, 22. You have the lighter neon, 20. And then you have these two heavy ones. But Dalton said there was only one type of neon, and all the neons have the same weight. So once again, the discovery of the mass spectrometer, which helps scientists come up with a mass spectrum, helped them to see that what Dalton said, it wasn't a lie. It just wasn't true. I mean, right. I guess you can, you can argue, well, if it's not true, it's a lie. Well, he said what he said based on the equipment he had, and his technology was more primitive, okay? So there are three different types of neon atoms versus what he said. The name we use to call these three neon atoms, to describe them, is the term isotope. So isotope is a term that is given to atoms of the same element having different weights. Okay, so one of the things that we do in chemistry, before we do the math, one of the things we do in chemistry is once you find a new phenomena or a new idea, you get to provide the name, okay? And I think I was joking last time and saying that Africans don't have their own science. If they did, they'll use a lot of words because we, we, don't, we don't just get to it with one word like blue, pink, sorry, uh-uh. It's always, there's a whole story behind the name, and the name is really, really long. <laughs> I had a student ask me one time, is that why y'all's names are long sometimes? I'm like, yeah, sometimes, you know? There's a whole background story before you hear somebody's name, right? They were born when it rained. Okay, this is not true of all African cultures, right? It, it's not true. So just in case you're of that culture where they don't do that, don't email me and let me know it's different for y'all. It's not true of all cultures. Anyway, so isotope was the name given to describe this phenomena. Isotope, you have atoms of the same element with different masses. So I was joking around in my other class and saying, <laughs> listen, I like to bring my personality into things I do, okay? So if it was me who discovered this, I will take the isotopes in the container, like maybe the beaker or something. I will hold them off in the lab and be like, you shall be called isotope. You know, like kind of like Simba. And the other class, they, 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 were, they were laughing. They were having a good time. Y'all are very quiet. But anyway, they were just like, yeah, like Simba. I'm like, exactly. I would do that, you know, because you get to name it. So the term isotope was put together to describe that. So anytime scientists saw, you know, the existence of atoms of the same element, the way the masses, they were different, they were like, ah, isotope, right, okay? So recognize that isotopes are written like this. We saw that before, right? Carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. And then here we, we just saw neon. So I saw neon, uh, what? 20, neon, was it 21? 21, and neon, 22. And the part of the isotopes that was different, the masses are different. Because 
the neutrons are different. Okay, so it's not the hmm, the neutrons are different. It's not the electrons or the protons that are different. Only the neutrons being different is what's causing these masses to be different, right? So you can conclude the existence of isotopes proved that Dalton was wrong. Okay. So I went, I went, I graduated from not caring about these details to thinking, man, imagine that's your legacy, right? I mean, you do this work, you publish it. Everyone's like, oh, it's so right. You're so smart. And then years later, somebody comes up with an instrument and then they prove you wrong. And now in the future, textbooks will be written about you, you know? And I'm like, man, do I even want to do any science? <laughs> You want to do it because ultimately it's good. It helps everybody, even though he messed up. Because I had a student once asking me, if they mess up, why are we learning about what they did? We're not learning it to shame them. We're learning it because even though they didn't get things right immediately, them messing up is what helped us. It's the foundation of us learning about science. With them messing up, we had to fix it, right? And we had to, to know why it was messed up, what made it wrong, what made it right. And in the process, we got to know better. So it's like, we get it wrong, we get it wrong, we get it better. Then we get it wrong again, then we do it better. But, but there will never be a better model or better understanding if somebody's not willing to do the work, right? So it's a journey. So once we've done all that, now that we've, done, we've looked at all of this, let's go back to the isotopic symbol. We discussed this earlier, or I'll say on Tuesday. You have the elements right here. Usually the symbol comes from the periodic table. And then you have the mass on top. Remember, the mass is usually protons plus neutrons. Then you have the proton number on the bottom, which is also called what? The atomic number? Okay. So periodic tables usually have these symbols for the elements. Some have more information, some have less. Well, the mass in the periodic table is the mass, which is technically, the way they get this mass is actually called a weighted average, a weighted average of the isotope, okay? So before we get into this question here, this active exercise, what exactly is a weighted average? Okay, in chemistry, when they add words, there's a reason for that. A weighted average is different from a math average. In a math average, every number's contribution counts equally, right? So it's not weighted. One number doesn't have a greater contribution than the other everyone's vote counts the same. So you have a regular average in math and then you have the weighted average. So going back to this picture right here, in this picture right here, if you're wondering how I knew it was neon, I just looked at the largest number. So in neon, you can see right here, neon has three different isotopes. This largest one is neon 20. This one here is neon 21. This one here is neon 22. Okay, so there are obviously three neons. If you have your periodic table, go ahead and look at it. Okay, so there was this one class where they're like, we can't see stuff. So let me see if I can find stuff for you. Let me see. Periodic table. Yeah, I was trying to show, and they're like, well, we can't see. So then I had to go ahead and pull up my periodic table. Can I see that one? Let me see. So hopefully y'all can see this periodic table. I'm trying to find one that I can look at where, oh, is this ration? It is. I think. Okay, the numbers I need are right here. So let me see if y'all can see. That is interesting. That's cool. Okay, this is the number I'm looking at right here. Okay, it's supposed to be 20.18. So when you look at this number right here, Hopefully you can see that. Let me make it bigger. Whoa, okay. That may be too big. Okay, I want to make sure you can see it, right? I don't know what this is, but this is supposed to be, supposed to be 
So when I looked at the number, I saw that the highest abundance or the highest line was on the 20. So I looked in the periodic table and I found that I knew it was neon. Okay, so you see the 20.18, right? Let me click back to my little slides. Neon has three different isotopes. When you average these out, considering the weight, this one here will contribute more. How do I know that? It has the highest percentage or highest amount. So usually they figure out the percentages, the relative amount of each of these. So let me, let me eyeball this. This is not going to be a perfect science. But let me say this one ends up being 80%. Okay. And then this one here ends up being like, Maybe I should say 85, because I'm just estimating, 85%. And this one ends up being like 10%. And this one ends up being what, 5%? Okay. So what we're saying here is, if you were to go out there and find an amount, okay? So you go out to real, you go out there real life, this is what, 10? I'm going to do, try to draw it like my, my, my periodic table neon. You go out there and you try to find a sample of neon. And you find 100% neon. Of the 100% neon, 85% will be neon 20. 5% uh, will be neon 21. And then 10% neon 22. So you can see... Since the percentages factor into the overall mass here, on my periodic table, this is 20.179, then this number we have here looks more like this number, right? The neon 20 looks more like this. So this one, this isotope influences the atomic mass most. Why? It has the highest percent. So just in case you're needing an analogy, it will be like if these were your assignments in the class. Okay? And I could use that analogy because people tend to understand that one better because it relates to them and, and it, it, it matters to them. Imagine this was not an isotope, it was an assignment. Say the first one number was an exam. The second number was lab. Sorry, the last number was lab, and then the second number was homework. And then I asked you, I told you that in this class, your exam is 85% of your grade. Your lab is 10% of your grade, and your homework is 5%. Then I asked you, which assignment influences your grade the most? I believe that, okay, before I say anything, does anybody, let me see if I can go back here. Before I say anything, can y'all guess which one you think will influence the assignment the most, your grade the most, between the exam, the homework, and the lab? Once again, go ahead and, ch and, and text your message in the, what is this called? The chat box or the message box or whatever that thing is called. Anybody? You don't know which one? Okay. It will be the it will be the exam, right? Because the exam has the highest percent. So just like in the percentages, the exam will be the one that influences your assignment the most. Same thing with this. This number here, because it has the highest percentage influences the periodic table mass. That's true of all the elements in the periodic table, right? You can tell. So anyway, since we've seen all that, let me now continue where we left off. So now we're going to be working on, it says here, the natural uh, distribution of the isotopes of boron is 19.9% 19, 19 boron 10 at a mass of, this is specific mass, and 80% of boron 11. Okay, let me go ahead and pull up a page and then we'll work this out. So natural distribution means if you go out there and naturally find boron, 
This is the percentage you see boron in. So one of the borons will be 19.9%. And this is the boron that has a mass of 10.012-9370 units. Jeez, that's a long number. Oh, by the way, here they're using the unit, the mass unit, that's just U versus AMU. So please notice that U is the same thing as AMU, which is the same thing as grams per mole, depending on what's needed. Some books will use U, some books will use AMU, some books will use gram per mole. Don't get caught up in that. Just recognize they're interchangeable, okay? So where was I? Long number. Okay, the next one is 80.1%. So when you add the percentages, they usually give you 100. Of the other boron is what? 11.00930555U. Okay. So once we have that, let's see. Now they're telling us figure out the atomic mass of boron. So there's a calculation for this one here. There's actually a formula. The atomic mass, the relative atomic mass, the mass in periodic table is the same thing as the relative atomic mass or just atomic mass. So I'm going to write here that RAM is the same thing as atomic mass. Okay. So the atomic mass of, uh, uh, let me see, of boron, this is the formula. Write the percent, divide by 100, multiplied by the AMU or the U, plus the percent divided by 100 multiplied by the AMU or the U, okay? You, you, you do want to be set up for every isotope you have. I only have two, so I'm going to write one for each, okay? So let's see. Da -da -da. The top one was what? 19.9100. Open parentheses, 10.012 one, <laughs> It's a long number. 80.1 divided by 100. Open parentheses, 11.00930555U. One, one, kind of reminds me of somebody's phone, right? So, yeah, I follow the format. Now, all I have to do is open parentheses, multiply things out, and I should get my numbers. Okay. 19.9 times 10.012970. I think I got it right. 10.012. I said 93 and I typed in 92. 9370. Okay. So, and then I divide this by 100. So over here I get 1.99. Two five seven. I'm going to stop there. This number is getting too long. Plus eighty point one times one one point zero zero nine three zero five five. Okay, divided by one hundred. Over here, I get eight point eight one eight four five. U. I take this second number, add it to the first number, 1.99, 1 1 1 long number. I end up with 10.811U. So, based on what they have here, they're saying that of the number of boron isotopes out there in real life, we have two that are very dominant. One is 80%, the other one is about 20%. So I'm going to say here, boron from the periodic table should have, what is my atomic number for boron, boron, boron? It should be 5 for the atomic number, and the mass number should be 10.81. Is that the case? Okay, let me find the periodic table, wherever it was. Where is boron? Right here. I don't know what this means. Maybe this is boron in, in Western. I don't know what that is. But yes, this is supposed to be point. 10.81. So you see, their boron has 
and I got what? 10.811. So if you just erase this part here, yep. Boron. Okay. So remember, this is the math they do to get these masses in the periodic table. Imagine this is somebody's job, right? You get hired, okay. <laughs> then you're sitting there all day long doing this math. So after all this, they're showing you all here, all, all the masses, and here are all the percentages. We have, this is just showing you two hydrogens. In reality, we have three hydrogens. The other one may not be very dominant, but we have three hydrogen atoms. We have the proton as we know it. We have deuterium and one called tritium that has, like, oh, there it is, my bad. I didn't, no, it's not, this is helium. There is tritium, there's one, one, Two one and three one. That is not here. Okay, but we have two for helium. It only shows one beryllium. So beryllium is only one type of beryllium. For carbon, wait, there are three carbons. So I guess they're not showing all of them. There is carbon twelve, carbon thirteen, carbon fourteen. We have two for nitrogen, two three isotopes for oxygen, one for fluorine. So how do you know that's the only isotope available? Look at the percentage. This is telling you for real there's only one beryllium. Why? Because all the ones they found all had these masses. Fluorine, there's only one kind. All the fluorines they found had these masses. Now, sulfur, there's three kinds. This one here influences the sulfur the most. So you can see that this number is very close to that number in sulfur. Okay. In oxygen, you have this first one, this one, and that one. This will influence oxygen the most, so you can see how this number, sorry, this number here is very close to that number in oxygen, okay? So recognize that scale. Okay, for this one here, it says use, the, oh, we're supposed to use this one here to figure out atomic number for sulfur. Okay, I can do that. I'll do it on a fresh page. Wait, what page am I on? Add a page. So for sulfur, we have how many sulfurs? We have four sulfur. So we have a sulfur. Oops, that's not sulfur. That is 94.93%. And the mass for that sulfur is 31.972. I'll round this up because it gets too long. The number just gets too long. I have my second sulfur, second isotope. That is 0.76%, and this number is what? 32.97. Uh, My third sulfur, where is that? Right here, is 4.29%. This is my sulfur. It's written up here, percentage, and this is math. So I'm, I'm going by that just in case you're wondering, okay? Where am I? I'm on my third sulfur. This is 33.9673. Three, I'm running out. I'm, I'm copying this number, by the way. And then on my fourth sulfur, so sulfur has four isotopes. Wow. That's only 0.02%. For that one, my number is 35.9671. Okay, so since I have this right now, let me go ahead and put this here so I don't miss anything. I don't want to miss anything. Okay, since I have four isotopes, I have to do four setups. You do your maths real quick, and these four should add up to 100, I think. Let me check it real quick. 94.9 plus 0.76 plus 4.29 plus 0 0.02 equal. It can close, but not exactly, 9.93. Yeah, it can close, but not exactly. But it's it's 9.97. So this is all I have. I'm going to use that. So I will start with my first sulfur. Uh, let's see. The percentage, 94.93 over 100 times 31.9721. U. Plus, um, I get the feeling I'm going to run out of space. So I need to make this smaller. Okay, this might be better. Okay, that's the first one. My second isotope is 
0.76 over 100, open parentheses 32.9714 U, close parentheses. Third isotope, 4.29 over 100 times 33.9679. You. <laughs> I thought I was going to write all the space. I thought I had enough space. No, I did not. Okay, I need to minimize that again. Okay. I'm just not aware of how much space I have. Okay, finally, last isotope. 0 0.02 over 100 times 35.9671U. Woo! Almost didn't make it. Okay. Four isotopes, four setups. Let's do this. First one, 0.94. Oh, sorry. 94.93. I was I kind of taking it. Yeah. Divided by 100, it gives you 0.9493. And then times 31.9721. Did I get that right? 9721. Okay. So from this first one, from this first isotope, I get 30.3511 you. Next, 0.76 divided by 100 times 32.9714. Okay, I'm getting 0.2506 U plus. 4.29 divided by 100 times 33.9679. Okay, I got 1.4572 U. Plus my final one, 0 0.02 divided by 100 times 35.9679. Seven. Was that zero or one? Oh, one. One U. Okay. I end up with zero point zero zero seven one nine. How about that? That's that's this is good. These numbers are long enough. Okay, so I'm gonna add them all up. Plus one point four five seven two. Plus point two five zero six. Plus 30.351 equal 32.066 U. Uh, uh, okay, so based on this, my sulfur will be 32.066. Mm, we'll leave it at that. Then the, the atomic number of sulfur is what? 16? 16. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. There's my sulfur. 32.06. Well, mine here says 32.066. Okay. My periodic table. This one here, I don't know. I don't know. Let's find a different periodic table because, first of all, it's got a comma where it should have. Uh, this is why you don't go by Wikipedia. <laughs> don't tell anybody I did that. <laughs> it was just the most clear looking one. The other ones are just, it's just, it's just hard to see. It's hard to see, you see? It's really hard to see these things. It's a struggle to find a good periodic table. Where is it? Where is this stuff? Let, they're always trying to get you to sign up for something. I'm like, can I just use your stuff for free? Do I really have to sign my life away? Okay. Anyway, y'all saw that, right? Let me see. There's one here that has that shows the masses better. Many of these don't really even show you the masses that well anymore. But yeah, you saw how it is, right? So the most important thing here is uh, with the sulfur. Let me see. Talking about Mendeleev's legacy. He's he's a scientist that came up with the periodic table, or at least the the old one. Anyway, I'm done with that. This is sulfur. This is our sulfur. It looks good enough to me. Yep, even theirs is not as good as ours. So like you saw, right, Mendeleev and Meyer are, actually Mendeleev gets more credit for this, but these are the fathers of periodic table. The scientists that came up with the periodic table, the old one, not the modern one. 
and they arranged elements in the tables. Now, Mendeleev was the one who was playing the card game that was like solitaire, and he was studying the elements, and he noticed similarities between the elements. You know, there were periodic appearances of certain kinds of properties. So it's kind of like a deja vu moment, right? Like, wait a minute. Uh, let me see. They don't really show it very well over here, but he saw certain periodic tendencies, right? Before we had a table that looked like this, the elements were arranged from left to right. So what they were doing, though, they saw similar properties in the elements and decided, what if we put these elements in the same column or row? They decided on putting the elements in the same column and saw that the elements in the same column had similar properties. So from them, we learned elements in the same in the same column and those columns were called family or group had had similar properties okay so scientists have a knack for trying to humanize elements because and, and you know what? I understand why, okay? When I'm reading chemistry, I'm, I'm reading about life. I'm like, okay, you know what? There is someone I know who this reminds me of. So scientists who even write, even their experimental results tend to humanize elements in, in order for us to relate to it. So they even say elements in the same column or group are family. So then it makes sense. You and your family have similarities. So elements in the same family will have similar properties, right? And they found these properties in regular intervals. And so the arrangements that they made, because this is so long ago, they were not perfect. They had a lot of errors because they used atomic weight. So bottom line here is Mendeleev and Meyer, these two men, arranged elements. according to atomic mass to figure out the trend in the behavior of the atom. And then uh, other scientists came in behind them and corrected the order and actually chose atomic number, okay? Because remember we just mentioned that if the, the number of neutrons are off, it messes up the atomic mass. So the number of neutrons were messing them up, and so they were getting the order wrong. Then scientists were like, wait a minute, why don't you use the number that doesn't change? Atomic number doesn't change. And not only that, atomic number ties into the identity of the element, so use that. Long story short, our modern periodic table, the elements are arranged according to atomic number. <laughs> I'm trying not to make this a story time, right? Like, and then this happened, and then you know how that goes, right? So the elements are arranged from left to right. Remember in the periodic table, atomic number is the red part, the small one. This is the one that has number of protons, also called atomic number. So this number here is number of protons, also called atomic number. The lower number, this number here, is the average atomic mass. The one that we use the formula to get, right? So that's true of all of these lower numbers here. And that was somebody's job to figure all that out. Okay? So they show that to you here. Yeah, atomic mass, which is just the same thing as number of protons. And then here... This one here has um, protons plus neutrons for atomic mass. Of course, we have the chemical symbol, right? So we already discussed that so many times. I'm going to move on. Okay, so back to the periodic table. When Mendeleev and Maya were studying this, they were, sh they were seeing that the elements could be arranged in the horizontal row. So I was messing up the row from the column. <laughs> And then my coworker was making fun of me, 
And I'm like, that's not nice. But she just reminded me, when you go to a concert, I'm like, I don't go to concerts. Anyway, when you go out there, you you see the rows of chairs. And I'm like, oh, okay, the chairs are uh, arranged from left to right. Rows, okay. And then columns are like, you know, vertical. I'm like, I get it now. So I don't know. It's the small things, right? So in the periodic table, the elements are arranged in horizontal rows from left to right. And these are also called periods, okay? So be aware of this term. The period is also the horizontal row from left to right. And the period is numbered from the top to the bottom, and it varies in length. So before I continue, let me go back to my periodic table and number my periods here. Okay. So period one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So period goes from left to right, from left to right, 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 left to right. This one, this group here is here. So it gets complicated. But you just want to be aware of what the period is, right? Going from left to right. That's all you have to do. Well, for right now, until it gets a little bit more deeper, right? Recognize period goes from left to right. Now, remember the similarity in the elements is usually the vertical similarity, the group part. So we're going to be looking at group, but let me use a different color right now. Group is the vertical relationship. Group, 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 group. Okay? And I, let me zoom this in so y'all can see. The group is the columns, right? The vertical relationship. We're going to be looking at this right now where you have 1A here, 2A, 3A. This is a little hard to see. 3A, 4A, because I have all these scribbles on this. 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. All the A elements are usually studied together, okay? And those are called a main group elements. So let me, first of all, be, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm just kind of rushing with this. We're going to get to it. It's right here, main group elements. So we saw the groups, right? These are the chemical family. <laughs> I like to joke, auntie, uncle, cousin, twice removed, you know, they're the family. They have similar properties. And so they're, they're placed in a group, okay? Groups are identified by two rows of numbers across the, the top of the periodic table. The two rows of numbers, usually you have your number and then you have your letters, right? And so, as far as the groups are concerned, we have the uh, elements from one of the A groups. So, the main group elements, these are the A group, okay? So, scientists de divide the groups in two. You have the A group and the B group. Transition elements, these are the B group. So it's, it's, it's not based on, I remember when we were in high school, no, we're in middle school, okay? I didn't appreciate this, but then again, maybe it wasn't such a bad thing. But um, when I went from middle, well, we had like four years of middle school. So the first two years of middle school, uh, we had a cohort. So me and my friends went through two years of classes together, taking the same classes all the time. And then we moved to like year three and year four, and they split us up and mixed us up into like two different groups. And I didn't appreciate that because my bestie, well, we didn't use the term bestie then, but my bestie got put in the A group and I got put in the B, B group. And they never told us why me and her were separate. I'm like, we used to sit together and have class together and do everything together and now we're separated. Later on, I found out that we were separated based on intelligence. And I was <laughs> filling the gaps, right? Listen, listen, listen. I am not ashamed of my journey, okay? This is part of my history. I found out the A group was super intelligent. They got stuff real quick. And the B group, well. <laughs> but come to find out later, the A group was better in biology. The B group was better in math. So it wasn't that we were just slow. Okay, listen, I'm telling the story. It wasn't that we were just slow. We were just better in math. So they assigned us the best math teacher. But the issue was like we, the A and the B group had the same career goal. So I don't even know what they were thinking. Then they assigned the A group the best biology teachers because they were just stronger in biology, you know. So I don't know what that was about. But as far as the elements are concerned, 
the A group and the B group, the A group has something in common. They are predictable. It's not about intelligence here. No, it's not. The B group are unpredictable. Right? So the A group are a lot easier to study because, well, they're the A group. The B group, man, it's like you're thinking they're going to act one way. It's like just throw all your assumptions out the door because I call this B, B group, it's complicated. With them, things are complicated. We're going to talk about them a little bit, not too much, because they are a complicated group. So they're the B group. Back to the periodic table. Where are these people? How? No, people, sorry. Elements. I'll keep saying people by mistake because in my head, the elements are like people, you know. They have preferences. They're things they will not do, and you can't make them do it. Let me just remind me of some people. I won't mention any names. Don't worry. Okay. So here are your B group elements. Right here. Okay. Look at how logical the A group are. 1A, 2A. Skip this whole block. 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A. 7A, 8A. So predictable, so logical. Look at the B group. When you're trying to number them, they don't even start from not, from 1. 3, 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B, 7B, 8B, 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 1B, 2B. What? I told you it was complicated. They're complicated, okay? And then you come to this group and they don't even have a label at all. <laughs> there is no label for this group. So I just say, you know what? They're complicated. They are complicated. But anyway, that's the groups, right? So you want to recognize A group, B group. Um, what, yeah, I just said they're predictable. And then the other way of classifying the periodic table is by metals and nonmetals and metalloids. Most of the different types of elements we have in the periodic table are actually uh, metals. So elements to the left of the stair step line, the zigzag, are pretty much metals. So elements to the left of the stair step line that begins between atomic number 4 and 5 in period 2 and end between atomic number 84 and 85. That's a lot of description. What they mean is, go back here. See that zigzag right there? This zigzag here. This separates. This is the border between the metals so most of these right here are metals i shouldn't say most these are metals these here are metals and then this small group here is the non-metal okay not that many so if you're if you're gonna count like what's that thing called a census there is more metals than there is non-metal but even though we have that surprisingly enough our most abundant remember abundant means available readily available in nature our most abundant element is carbon why carbon because all living things have carbon and we got a lot of living things right okay just like with any culture of or any neighborhood when you have a barrier or some kind of separation or a border the people near the barrier tend to have uh, a mixture, a hybrid of the culture, right? This happens in real life. Like if you're studying anthropology, I don't do that, but I like studying people because I realize a lot of similarity between some people. Side note. So the elements here near who are actually on that border, they tend to have properties of both metals or non-metals, like people do. And so they're sometimes called semi or semi metals or semiconductors they use a semiconductors right why semi not full conductors metals are full conductors non-metals are not conductors these are right in between semi metals semiconductors so if you need an element to kind of have both properties you want to pick that group over there Okay. Okay, where was I? Yeah, and those are your metalloids. Elements that border the stair step line. Okay. I showed you the nonmetals. So with the ones that are metalloids that have both properties, you have 
BSI, so you have boron, silicon. Silicon, of course, we really know that for semiconductors, it's the whole Silicon Valley, right? And we know silicon, okay, so back in the days, back before the recent days, silicon used to be known for semiconductors. Now we know silicon for under, other reasons, right? I won't say, but y'all can read between the lines, right? Because my other class, they said it, and I was like, mm-hmm, yeah, that. And when it's used for that purpose, it's not because it's a semiconductor. It's because of other reasons. But anyway, then we have germanium, we have acetine, or sorry, arsenic. And then we have uh, antimony and tellurium. So these are the elements that live on the border. I mean, they don't really live on the border, but they are in that border between metals and nonmetals. So they have both behaviors. Okay, so here we're told, list active exercise, list the atomic number or chemical symbol, atomic mass of the third period element in group 6A. Third period element. Okay, so I'm going to ignore all the work down there. So I need to erase all of this. Erase. Oh, that was good. It's really hard to get this off at once. Okay, off, 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 off. Okay, period three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Period three is somewhere here. It says group six. So period three is this section right here. Group six is right here. So we're talking about sulfur. Okay, so they want sulfur, atomic number, mass number, 32.06. Okay, let me see what else they wanted, because that, that's all I can remember. Atomic number, mass number. Atomic number, chemical symbol, atomic mass of the third period. Yeah, that's what I did. So sulfur is the element. Chemical symbol, S. Atomic number is 16. Oh, 16 is usually at the bottom. Atomic mass, 32.066. That was it? Oh, classify the element as either a main group element or transition. This one here being in group 6A is main group, because main group is 6A. And then let me see, metal or non-metal? Sulfur is definitely a non-metal right based on where it is so right here yeah it's not on the border so sulfur is definitely not metal okay what else are they asking is that it oh okay they give an explanation down here we're close to the end close to the end study figure 5.20 briefly look at the table try to name as many elements as possible so i'll let you guys do that study the, the figure this one here when we were in middle school, I think, it was so many years ago, I forget. I want to say middle school, at some point in my life, before today, <laughs> we had to memorize the first 20 elements. Oh, it was so difficult to memorize it. So we did a mnemonic. I, I, I can't even spell mnemonic right now on the fly. But the mnemonic is like when you're saying other words, but they mean this, like it's, you know, like King Philip cried, whatever, whatever. So we use that, but it's in Swahili, so it won't be helpful to you. You'd have to learn a different language just for you to learn a mnemonic, just to learn this. So you can find one of those in English, right? And we were supposed to memorize the first 20 elements. And then when we got to high school, we had to memorize these right here. Right, I remember high school. So the first 20, so by the time we're done with high school, we knew the first 30, like, by heart, positions and everything. But, yeah, you can find mnemonics online. I think it's, like, M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C, something like that. But mnemonics, where people make up words, and then you remember, remember those words, and then they help you remember the order of things. Yeah, I struggle memorizing, so I use that a lot. Yeah, feel free to to work on this. Please don't, don't, don't forget these things, because you, you really want to know what these elements are as they're going to keep referring to them later on. Okay. 
So this slide here shows you the Pasha periodic table. So for it to make sense in the storyline, remember that all the elements were not discovered in a short period of time. It took years. I mean, scientists have really recently, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Scientists have been working so hard recently to, to discover the elements that are down here. So elements are still being discovered even as we speak today. Right, so they're, they're working to finalize the information of the elements that are down here. The point being, all the elements were not discovered at once. So as scientists were discovering the elements, for example, this one here, this element, which is what, germanium? Germanium was not discovered early on. It was discovered later in life. But, but Mendeleev noticed that since elements in the same family have the same property, he was able to guess the behavior of the element that will be right here, we'll call it element X, it wasn't discovered yet. He was able to guess, so Mendeleev guessed. Now we don't use the term guessed, in, that looks so floppy. We just say hypothesize, it sounds a lot better. Hypothesize. That's when you're really guessing, but you got a lot of evidence. He has hypothesized the characteristics characteristics of the unknown element before it was discovered. He even named it, but he didn't know its actual name. So he called the, the element Eka Silica which Eka in their, in their language means under. <laughs> so he, he was funny like that. He's like, I don't know what it's called. I just, even though we don't, we haven't found it yet, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist, right? Because look at this, they found these. So he's saying, even though we have not discovered it yet, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. When we find it, it will have a name. For right now, I'll call it under silica. And he was able to figure out the characteristics and the characteristics that he found for Eka silica, which we now call germanium, germanium, were so close to the actual one. Imagine that before his time, right? Before they discovered it. Later on, when scientists discovered it, they were able to compare the two characteristics and realize that he did very well. So he discovered e Eka silica and Eka aluminum, this one too. And he did better with the Eka aluminum than he did with the Eka silica. But the point being that he was able to discover it by understanding that if elements are in the same column or family, they have the same properties. So if sulfur has certain properties, right? If you know the behavior of, sul uh, sorry, of silicon and the behavior of tin, then you can predict the behavior of whatever this is, which is germanium, to be somewhere in between. Okay, and I guess I see that I'm at the end. That's pretty much the end of this chapter. So we will pick up where we left off today next week. Does anybody have any questions? Wait, this is my other class. Let's see this one here. Yeah, this is pretty much all I have. So. Please go review. This chapter is really not bad. It doesn't have a lot of math, you know, but don't forget we discussed the three, the three atomic models between, you know, the, the X best friends. So in the next chapter, we will talk about the two newest and the latest atomic model, Bohr's model, the fabulous Bohr's model that's used in Jimmy Neutron, Big Bang Theory, and all things science, that biology loves that model and Hollywood loves that model. Chemists, we are like, eh, yeah. And then the quantum mechanical model, the model, model that's so deep, it's hard to find it online. <laughs> when you can't find something online, you know it's deep, right? The model that's so deep, that is so complicated, that most people want to act like it doesn't exist, but it's very important because that's the model that gives us all the new technology we have. Everything Wi-Fi is from that model, okay? So we are the generation that should really, really love that model because... It gives us wireless, Wi-Fi, all the cool technology we get to have today, swiping, all that stuff comes from that model, okay?
that's all I have for today, guys. Uh, have a nice weekend. Um, yeah, if you have questions or whatever, you can email me. But this is all I have for today. Okay, so I'm going to be signing off. Are y'all good? Okay. Have a nice evening.